Okay, so within this video, what we're going to do is we're going to go through learning outcome one, and this is going to be for the OCR level three IT, and it's going to be unit one. So inside of this, what we're going to do is we're going to work through, and we're going to go through one point one to one point seven. Um, 1.8 and 1.9 what we'll be doing is we'll be going through that in a separate video because they are numbering systems and they are um, binary and hexadecimal so uh, as part of computer hardware um, there is hardware is the physical things as part of a computer now these might be either the internal pieces of the hardware or external uh, and these are split up into um, into some subgroups. Uh, the two are called input devices, output devices, and communication devices. First one is input devices. Um, so input devices are used um, to basically enable a user to control a computer. And now these might be stuff like mice, keyboards, as you can see on the right hand side on the image. Uh, you know, you've got bar scanners, you've got fingerprint scanners, you've got all these things that will take images or take some kind of input inside of a actual computer system. Each one does something slightly different, but it still enables you to put data and information inside of a computer. So it's for us to communicate with the computer system. There's other things. So if, um, if for instance, you had a specific disability, there are certain things well that you can use as an input device also stuff like voice activation if you haven't got use of your limbs the next one is output devices so these are stuff that are going to consist of um, how the computer can interact with you so when you click on play music uh, sorry play music for instance when you do that the actual speakers will kick out the sound so these are the output devices and like you can see there, it's stuff like, you know, you've got monitors, you've got printers, you've got big plotters, you've got uh, speakers and headphones, you've also got a braille terminal as well. And what braille is, is basically how you can print out um, using braille for people who might be visually impaired. Um, now as we know, braille is uh, like small like little raised dots on an actual piece of paper. But it's printed out like that, so you can, um, so people who are uh, visually impaired can still read, um, uh, like anybody else. The last one inside of this, the computer hardware, is it's going to be called communication devices. Now these aren't less than like telephones or whatever. These are actual pieces of hardware that will allow computer to communicate with another computer. So these are specific pieces of hardware, so stuff like modems, um, network interface cards, we've got terminal adapters, we've got wireless routers, you probably see most of these in your course. Stuff like hubs, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so as we move on, this is going to be 1.2, and this is called um, the actual uh, inside of a computer, okay? And these are the computer components. So the first one that says RAM. So RAM is, stands for Random Access Memory, and it's the main memory inside of a computer. What this will do is this will, uh, RAM is required to load up the operating system. So when it is loaded up through the ROM, which we're going to go on in a sec, it will be stored temporarily inside of the RAM. Now, when we load up games, we load up um, PowerPoints, all them kind of things, these will actually uh, be inside of uh, RAM. The more RAM inside of a computer, the best the performance, because we can open up more programs at the same time. The next one's ROM, and ROM stands for read-only memory. And what ROM actually will do is it will enable the computer to start up. This is called the boot sequence. Um, and inside of the boot sequence, it's called a BIOS, which is basic input output system. The basic input output system, what it will actually do is it will enable us to, um, to check to make sure that the hard drive's working, uh, USB drives are working, all these kind of things are working to ensure that the, um, the computer and the operating system can run to its full capacity.
Okay, so now we're going to move on to the CPU. Okay, um, now inside the CPU, it's often called the brain of the computer. This is where all the thought process comes in. And like it says there, it processes all the data and instructions. So when you want to open up a program, say a game called Fortnite, for instance, uh, you all the instructions will go through the uh, the CPU. CPU stands for the top central processing unit, and the speed of the CPU will depend on a couple of different things. First one is clock speed. This is how many times it will uh, go around the cycle, and we're going to go through that cycle in a sec. But the cycle is called the fetch decode execute cycle. The next one is the amount of cores. So, for instance, how many processors are inside of the CPU? So, for instance, if we have got two processors working at the same time, or we've got four processors working at the same time, there is normally more chance of the uh, the four cores running faster than what it is for two, because they're doing four sets of instructions at the same time rather than two. And the last one there, which is cache size. Okay, it's not catchy. It is cache size, and what that does is that enables the computer to store the, the most recent instructions um, as part of cache. So if you want to recall them again, it knows exactly where it is, so it's nice and fast to then load up. Okay, so we've got fetch the code execute, and what this will do is this will start a fetch, and this will actually use these things called registers. Okay, and these registers. These will enable us to copy memory address from PC to MAR, and the MAR stands for Memory Address Register. It will copy the instruction from the MAR to the MDR, so the instruction will actually go into the Memory Data Register, and it will actually increment the program counter. So in other words, once we've started a, um, an instruction, it will just add one onto the program counter. Next one, it will go round to decode, and the instructions um, in the MDR will be decoded. And what that means is decoded is it will look at it uh, and think, okay, what does it need to be, and understand exactly what instructions needs to open up. This is normally done in binary. The next one is execute. This will actually load up and execute, finalize the actual data. So this is open it up in a in your in your RAM, so you can actually use it inside of your computer. An example of this might be opening up a file out of a hard drive. The next one is the components of a CPU. So this is obviously uh, how a CPU needs to work. First one is control unit. So this executes the program instructions and controls the flow of data. So this will make sure that it doesn't get too um, it, it doesn't work too hard. The ALU, which is the arithmetic logic unit, this will complete all the calculations. So, for instance, all the logic operations through the logic gates. Logic is whether it is greater than, less than, equal to, all them kind of things. And that's one is cache. This is a very fast memory, uh, and it stores regular, uh, regularly used data. So, for instance, if you're always using a web browser, it will understand where it will keep them instructions saved, so it's faster to load up next time. Okay, the motherboard. Okay, as you see on the right hand side, the motherboard is the main board of the computer, and this is where everything is centralized. So, for instance, um, it has got uh, the CPU directly connected onto it. All right, um, such as hard, uh, stuff like hard drives and all them kind of things, they are just plugged into it, and they are using the expansion ports. Okay, so the expansion ports uh, will look something like this here, and also over here as well. Okay. Uh, your RAM will actually have put in here, okay, which are them slots as well. So it just basically puts everything all together so it is all run through one central board. Also, there is printed small, like little, they look like little roads. This is how the data will move from one side to another. So, for instance, where if we connect our peripheral, in other words, our input device into here, it can then travel through to the CPU. And then it might be able to travel into the output devices, which is there. And it'll then be able to output into the VGA cable. Now, the next one is uh, storage. Now, storage there is going to be, um, it's used a lot in the, in the new computer systems. 
Um, it's normally classed as external memory or auxiliary. In other words, it's backup memory. Okay, it's classed as non-volatile. Um, in other words, it can't be deleted if the electricity is turned off. So if you've got, say, a USB pen drive, um, it can be taken out of electricity. In other words, it can be taken out of the computer and it will still work because it will still store all that information. First one, it's hard drives. Hard drives are predominantly made out of these um, these metal discs, okay? And as you can see here on the picture, there is loads of metal discs that will spin round and this little read right head that will keep moving backwards and forwards to read the disc. There is not uh, there is not only one to move onto the top disc, there is multiple to move on all discs. Like it says there, um, it is stored magnetically in two sectors, okay? So there might be a little section which might be a certain game or a movie or anything. Good thing is it's, it's long lasting and reliable. Whereas, um, and it's quite portable as well. So, uh, external hard drives are quite portable for anyone to use them. Bad thing is that it can be corrupt or damaged. If you drop these, the actual plates, the actual metal discs can actually, uh, it can actually shatter. Okay. The next one, solid state drives. So solid state drives are similar to uh, hard drives, but there is no movable parts inside of them. Now this is called flash memory, okay, and this enables data to be saved onto chips. Now SSD cards uh, or SSD drives are um, are really quick because there's no movable parts in them. So that's compared to a hard drive that has got movable parts and the discs have got to spin. Um, so yeah, so that is how uh, they are the second uh, of the solid state drives. The next one, which is flash memory. Okay, so flash memory will be stuff like um, sort of USB pen drives, SD cards, all them kind of things. So it, it is basically the same as what it is uh, as an as an SSD. Okay, but uh, so flash memory could be deemed as something a bit more smaller, something that might go into the side of the computer, or alternatively, it might go into um, into the back of your phones or them kind of things just to give you some extra storage normally mobile phones so uh, apple they will have their own storage and you cannot expand them whereas on android you will be able to put in sd cards to give you to give yourself some more memory cloud storage cloud storage is used and it is it is the newest piece of storage that is used predominantly um, it is used over a private network, um, which means you'll be able to um, log in anywhere you are. Prime example for this is, um, is Apple. So if you use like an iCloud, for instance, when you take a photo, it will get stored onto your iCloud. If you lose your phone, then your uh, photos will automatically then be backed up. Um, and then you've just got to use your username and password to log in on the computer. Uh, normally users will pay for the cloud storage so for instance if um, uh, I know on Apple you get five gigabytes for free if you want any more then you've got to pay for more so it's easily expandable but that does come at a cost to you okay uh, types of computer systems so there's loads of different ones uh, these could be come from um, embedded systems such as you know uh, microwaves uh, washing machines or them kind of things um, but at the moment there is a lot of um, there's a lot of specifics in terms of des uh, desktop systems uh, tablets and hybrids uh, smartphones embedded systems and the, the last one which is mainframe and quantum computers that you might not have ever heard before so the first thing we're going to go to is a desktop machine. You have probably used these. You probably use them in school. You use them in loads of different places. And these are just your bog standard computers or your server machines that will be based in schools, buildings, offices, all them kind of things. Um, like it says there, the, these machines are relatively powerful and are really good to uh, to use for a lot of productive uh, productivity reasons such as using Photoshop, using um, loads of high-end sort of uh, movie making software such as um, 
uh, Premiere Pro, all, all them kind of pieces of software. So these are really, really good for stuff like that. Next one is tablets and hybrids. So obviously this is stuff like laptops, uh, tablets that can be used. Really popular choice if you are on the go. Um, people can use them on laptop, on uh, sorry, on trains, on buses, back of taxis, all them kind of things. Really, really functional. Um, graphics aren't the best compared to um, a desktop computers, but they are still uh, worthy of using um, this just to answer emails, to maybe make some small powerpoints, even watch some films if you're going away on, uh, abroad on holiday. The next one. Smartphones, so obviously smartphones nowadays give us a lot of flexibility. Um, smartphones now have really, really improved. Um, you can now get like AI uh, or augmented reality inside of the phones. So uh, it, it gives you another dimension. Um, this will allow us to, to be socially entertained. So in other words, it will allow us to connect to everyone, connect to our friends, connect to our family just at a touch of a button and it's normally uh, that small that you can put it in your pocket. Embedded systems, so these are normally done by RFID chips uh, and these are uh, these basically enable us humans to interact with different computer systems. So an example there is uh, cars have got monitors that, um, that check their tire pressure if the tire pressure goes down it, uh, on the dashboard it will alert and say you need to put air in your tires like you can see on the picture on the left hand side um, and then that will pop up. That is all done by using an embedded system through an RFID chip. Mainframe and quantum computers. Uh, now these are big main computers, these are infrastructure um, computers that basically give us um, connectivity everywhere. So prime example is we talked before about cloud storage. Cloud storage is normally stored on inside of quantum computers uh, and mainframe computers. These would be big server rooms that will enable us to connect to it at the same time. If one computer goes down, there will be another one there to kick in so there's no downtime at all. So it's, that makes sure that is reliable. Also, it is massive, okay? Um, uh, Facebook have got big massive server rooms so when you post an image on Facebook it will get stored not in this thing called the internet it will get stored on a server inside of a mainframe or quantum computer depending on um, on where it is so m normally um, it will be stored in, um, in America that's where Facebook is normally stored Okay, so um, we're going to go through now the uh, connectivity and the cables that are used. Um, there is two. One's called an unshielded twisted pair and a shielded twisted pair. Okay, when it is unshielded, that basically means that, and if you have a look here, there is um, basically a lot less in terms of the, um, the insulation on inside of it. So if you noticed here, we have got the, the cable shield, okay? So you've got the cable shield that runs right the way around the outside, okay? So normally what you'll find is, is the shield of twisted pair is normally used um, and is a lot more, um, is a lot more stable for, um, for transferring through. And like it says there, it's usually used for telephone systems, okay? Okay. The next one is fiber optic. Okay, so fiber optic is actually used out of glass, uh, and what it does is is it enables us to send um, high high speed information down uh, the wires, uh, and enable us to get some high quality internet speeds. This will also um, have no interference. Um, so in other words, because it, it's glass, there is nothing to stop it. Whereas previously, like it says there, it's copper. So there's a lot of uh, restrictions in terms of that material. Um, it's used over very long distances. So we can, we can send information um, across the internet extremely, extremely quickly. Um, and also it doesn't actually lose any signal uh, quality. 
uh, like I said, because there is no interference, there is no sort of friction on the signal, uh, it just sort of uh, shoots through using a little, um, it's like a light beam, okay, and that's, and that's what it looks like. Um, now, um, a bad thing though is, is it's extremely expensive to use, that's why fiber optic internet is a lot more expensive compared to mainstream normal internet. Okay. So um, these are all the pieces of hardware used inside of a network. So the first one is going to be a network hub. Okay, these are basically the central connections for all devices within a network. Okay, and what happens is you see here we've got the CAF5 cables. These are called your Ethernet cables. These are just plug in and then enable us to, to connect into the internet. Next one is a switch. Okay, so our switches will connect multiple hubs together. Okay, so for instance, in a classroom, in a school, you're going to have a hub per classroom, and then they will then connect into a switch. The switch then will connect into the main server inside of a computer, inside, inside of the school. Router. So routers, these forward the packets between the networks, okay? So these route all the information from one to another. And these are the main thing to actually en enable us to connect to a WAN, which is a wide area network. Okay, so this thing called a hybrid network. Okay, so this includes internet access, wireless and wired internet. Okay, so prime example, again in school, we have got wired connections, which is our desktop computers in the IT suites. And then we have also got uh, the wireless access points that are based uh, all around the school. So troubleshooting. Troubleshooting is used um, in a lot of different ways inside of um, IT. And the first one is, for instance, if um, if a computer is broke, what will actually happen is, say, if there's a piece of paper stuck, it will actually pop up and say, do this, do that, do this, do that, and it will give you certain steps. Then you need to follow it to then unblock the printer itself. This is really good because it will enable us to, to fix the printer ourselves um, and not really ask anybody else. This is also designed to ensure that it is easy for the um, companies, big businesses, to cut down on uh, IT bills so they can actually do it themselves. Okay, so when investigating a problem, so when investigating a, a hardware problem, we need to look at the following. We need to always make sure that there is power to the machine. Um, a lot of people might think, oh, this isn't working. Why is it not turning on? It might be a, um, it, it might be a wire that's pulled out the back. It might be a, like a turned off plug. Um, so that's the first thing we need to do. The next one is scan to make sure the hardware works properly. So what you do is make sure that everything works according to plan. So if, if something's wrong with the hard drive, make sure that you can save stuff to it. Also make sure that all the software is fully up to date. Okay, normally um, if hardware fails, that basically means that there is something to do with the software on it maybe. Um, stuff like firmware, which is um, uh, the sort of the latest updates, latest security updates. The next one is it will actually record the actions taken when fixing the problem. So if we found something wrong with a certain device or a certain piece of software, it will record it and it will record it in like a little log. And then that log will actually do is is if something happens again that's roughly the same error, it knows what to do to fix it because it's already fixed it once before. And the last one there it says record the time taken to complete this problem. Okay, so if, for instance, it takes five minutes the first time round, it might take one minute the next time round because we already know what the problem is and we already know how to fix it. The next one, okay, so we've got POST, okay. Now POST stands for Power on Self Test. What this will do is this will automatically test the computer system to make sure that it works making sure that everything is there. Obviously, inside of that, there might be some errors. It will try and fix it automatically. If it can't, then it will just tell you what is wrong with the actual, uh, what, what is wrong with the actual computer itself. And it looks something like this. So postcodes, um, these are pretty outdated now, but it'll look like this. And it'll be done in a two digit hexadecimal. Uh, and what will happen is you will uh, search that two digit hexadecimal code that will be based in the user manual. And then you can check to see what is wrong with it and how to actually fix it yourself. 
okay beep code so beep codes work roughly the same as uh, postcodes but this time it just beeps instead of actually sh shows like a little uh, uh, lcd now the lcd um is not really on like desktop computers anymore and um, so that's why they use beeps and beeps um so for instance if there's one beep for instance it means it's all good um but it, the, the beeps will depend on uh what kind of model computer it is so for instance there it says a dell computer will beep twice if there is no ram in the computer so when you hear two beeps that means oh there's no ram then you can fix it and then hopefully get it started This one is called a ping test. Okay, so ping test are methods uh, basically just to check to make sure that sending messages from one to to another is working correctly. Okay, sometimes what you do is you might get ping test while playing on games. Uh, this will basically check to see how fast the actual internet is, and also it will determine um, whether it can communicate effectively with other uh, clients. This is quite evident when you play on games and you want to play online uh, and one ping test comes back lower than the other. Um, normally then that the lower ping test can't then play because it is too slow to keep up with the network. And the last one we're going to go through is called NS Lookup Tests. Okay, and these are specific, um, these are lookup specific websites to check to make sure that they are live. So these make sure that if you are going to set up a, um, a website, that it needs to be there. And if it isn't there, um, then where does it move to? And these are normally through the, the client and also the, the, uh, the main name server, which is called DNS.